concluded that if we could just get people to think outside the box, we could be more innovative. And that phrase has become the universal catchphrase for all creativity. What people don't know, most people don't know is this. Right after that research, two other researchers did the same study, used the same puzzle, but gave people the answer before they attempted the puzzle. They essentially got the answer to, to draw outside the lines. What do you think the success rate was of the people who were given the answer? Well, you would think it would be higher, right? You would think, guess what? It's 20%, no change whatsoever. Thinking outside the box is a complete myth. And I want you to realize when people tell you to think outside the box, what are they really saying? Here's what's true. Here's, what's, here's what happens. When the human mind is sent outside the box in a vast, unconstrained space, it tends to overwhelm the mind. The mind suffers idea chaos or idea anarchy. It has a very difficult time searching for an idea in this too, too vast of a space. And what I'm going to show you is better thinking happens when we constrain our mind in a well-defined area using a set of tools to guide and channel our thinking for us. So where does this come from? And by the way, I'm going to encourage you to feel free to write things in the chat rooms. Uh, Stephen is monitoring, I'm monitoring the chat rooms and I'll be doing some exercises where you'll be required to type, type into the chat room. So please find where that facility is on your Zoom. Let's learn about this, this idea of systematic creativity. If you look at some of the most successful people creatively in history, you would certainly think of people like the Beatles, for example. The Beatles sold more albums in countries like the US than any other rock band. And Paul McCartney right here, Paul McCartney has not one, but two, at one time he had two of the top 10 best-selling songs of all time, billion dollar selling songs. I mean, it's incredible to have one billion dollar song, but to have two, how do you do that? And it turns out in one of the several biographies about Paul, I found this, this comment. Here's what Paul said. As usual for these co-written things, John often had just the first verse, which was always enough. It was the direction. It was the signpost. And it was the inspiration for the whole song. I hate the word, but it was the template. Paul and John had a series of patterns, formula, templates that they used to create all those great songs. And by the way, they're not the only creative artists that have used templates. Other songwriters, composers have used templates. Other types of artists like Salvador Dali or Pablo Picasso, if you look at their paintings, you will see an underlying structure. You, you would recognize a Picasso that you had never seen before. You would suspect it was a Picasso because why? You can see the underlying structure in it. Look at authors like Agatha Christie or Daniel Steele or William Patterson. Any of these prolific authors are using structures. They're using patterns. Poets, Robert Frost, they all use patterns, folks. What's interesting to me is they don't want you to know they use a pattern. <laughs> and why do you think that is? Type it into the chat room. Why do you think they don't want us to know they use patterns? Who has an idea? Any ideas? Type it in the chat room. Why do you think the, the, the highly successful creative people out there don't want us to know they use patterns? Go ahead and type it into your chat. They sell them, they sell them. Okay, maybe, maybe Chuck's point is they don't want you to know uh, their, their formula, their secret formula. That could be it, Chuck. I don't think so. I think I have another reason. Anybody else? Their branding technique. So look at the comment by um, Malika. Did I say that right, Malika? 
so they won't sound innovative. I think you're right. I think the highly successful people don't want you to know they use patterns because it doesn't seem creative. Using a pattern seems to take away, seems to cheapen the, the creative output. When in, when in fact, that pattern is what boosted their creative output. And what we should be thinking about is this. You know, what if, what if we use patterns? Um, Hiroko-san, what if, what if you used a pattern to write a song? What if you wrote a song using Paul McCartney's pattern? Would you end up with a billion dollar selling song? Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe not Hiroko-san, but here's what I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet you would end up with a more creative song using his pattern than if you didn't. Mm. Patterns can boost your creative output too. And the important question for all of us is simply this. What if all of us use patterns? How would it boost our creative output? And here's the interesting part of the story. It's not just creative artists that have used patterns. Innovators, inventors for thousands of years have used patterns in their inventions and in their solutions, many times without even realizing. And those patterns are now embedded into the products and services you see around you every day. Think of these patterns as the DNA of a product or service. Well, imagine you had a way to extract that DNA and reapply it to any product, any process, any service, any business model, organization, any structure to generate new ideas. That's what this is about. And what you're being exposed to is a method. It's a method that has a name. The method is called Systematic Inventive Thinking, or SIT for short. And it's based on the research by my co-author and good friend, Jacob Goldenberg. You see standing beside me here. Jacob did a very interesting thing for his PhD work. He studied highly innovative products initially to find out what made them different from one another. And what he found is that no, highly innovative products have more in common with one another, but they tend to follow a set of patterns. And those patterns can be reapplied to just about anything. The even more surprising element is this. Most innovative products in the world can be explained by one of five patterns. Five patterns. Subtraction. Many inventions were created by removing a core element rather than adding a new system or function. Task unification. Task unification is the pattern where you force a component in the system to do a new job. An existing resource takes on a new task in a way that at first probably didn't make any sense at all. Multiplication. Multiplication is the idea of taking a component you copy it, but change it along some qualitative line. Division. Division is the idea where you take a product or a component of it, you cut it physically or functionally, and then rearrange it back into the system somehow in a way that at first doesn't seem to make any sense, which I'll explain in a minute. And finally is the attribute dependency technique. Attribute dependency is the pattern where two attributes of the system have now have a correlation, a dependency. As one thing changes, another thing changes. So think about a product like uh, transition sunglasses. Some of you may know this product. It's a product where as the light outside gets bright, the lens of the glass gets dark. Or in some of your cars, your automobiles, you have windshield wipers that speed up and change speed depending on the amount of rain that's falling, falling. A classic example of attribute dependency. I'm going to share two of these techniques with you uh, this evening. I'm going to in introduce some key principles. Think of SIT as a set of five technique, pattern-based techniques and some key principles. And by the way, I will be sending all these slides to your professor afterwards. 
so you have access to this and anything else uh, in my possession. Okay, so let's move on. And again, don't be bashful. I'm going to call on you in a few minutes here to use your chat function and be part of the discussion here uh, and, and contribute. Let's, let's learn about these patterns and how to use them. To use these patterns, you have to buy into a very important idea. Here's that idea. Most people think the way you innovate is that you start with a problem and then you innovate to some solution to that problem. Problem to the solution. Well, guess what? What if I told you that in fact, there is another direction of innovation? That in fact, you can start with a solution that you don't know what it does and then work backwards and connect it to the problem that it solves. Now, I know that might sound crazy, but guess what? Humans are actually better at this direction than the other direction. Let me go off screen and see if I can prove that to you. All right. Let's, let's do a quick experiment. I want you to imagine this is not a cup of coffee. Let's imagine I'm holding a baby's milk bottle. This milk bottle changes color when the temperature of the milk changes. So quickly, type it into your chat function. Why would that be useful? Quickly. Type it into your chat function. Why would that be useful? Why would it be useful to have a milk bottle that changes color? Even if you haven't typed it into the chat function, you must have slow fingers tonight. The, the answer, let's see what we got here. Yeah, so temperature measurement, mother can know the good timing of the feeding. Yep. So. So if you didn't type it, I'm willing to bet you were thinking it immediately. You would know if the milk was too hot. You would know that the, the baby might not be safe. And any audience anywhere in the world immediately gets that same, that same connection. Now let's do it again, but let's, let's do it this way. What if I had said to this group of 36, what if I had said to you this? Hey folks, let's come up with a way on how not to burn a baby with milk that's too hot. How long would it take us in this room? I see Chuck thinking, uh, how long would it take us in this room, in this Zoom room, to come up with color changing milk bottle? How long? A long, long time, a very long time. Yep, and I see many of you acknowledging that. It would, it would take, certainly would take much longer than the other way. And so here's the, the other reality is we may never come up with a color changing milk bottle. But given the configuration first, we very fluidly connected it to the benefit. And so you already have this ability to go from the configuration, no matter how weird it seems, and connect it back to some benefit. That's what this method is all, all about. Let me go back to sh uh, sharing my screen. And Stephen, if you could just give me a thumbs up that you see my slides now. Okay, good. All right, so let's talk about this, this idea. Here on this slide are the, the steps that you follow in your brain, the cognitive process that we follow. It's called function follows form. I'll explain that in a minute. To use the SIT method, we start with an existing situation. That situation could be a product, like a milk bottle. It could be a program, like an MBA program. It could be a college. It could be a factory. It could be a mar marketing campaign. We define what we call the closed world around it. We, we, we draw an imaginary boundary around it. And I'll explain what that is a little bit later tonight. When we define the closed world, then we apply a thinking tool. We take one of these five techniques that I just told you about, these patterns, and we apply them to the thinking tool. We apply the thinking tool to the existing situation. 
When we do that, it morphs it, it changes it. It turns it into something that at first may not seem recognizable, something we call a virtual product. And we're gonna do an example of this in a minute. That virtual product is where you're going to experience a lot of discomfort. You're going to experience a condition called fixedness. It's not going to make sense at first. You're going to, to shake your head and go, well, that's stupid. Fixedness is a cognitive bias that we all have, and you can't get rid of it. Fixedness is how we understand our world around us. And we, when we see something strange, our fixedness kicks in and calls it out as, as strange. And that's, that's the step right here where you're going to experience that. No matter how strange it is, we then ask ourselves two questions, but always in this order. The first question we ask ourselves simply is, should we do it? What would be the benefit of a color changing milk bottle? Who would want it and in what situations? Are there benefits of cost, of time, efficiencies? I call this the market filter. We don't waste our time. If there's no benefit, then psh, throw it out. If we find a benefit, then and only then do we ask ourselves the second question, which is, can we do it? Is it feasible? Do we have the know-how, the materials, the science? Are there regulatory barriers or intellectual property barriers? What would it take to create a color-changing milk bottle? I call this the implementation or technical filter. If you have a great idea, you still have to be able to have some sense of being able to do it has to be feasible or psh, throw it out. Don't waste any more time on stupid ideas. You allow yourself some adaptations, which we'll see in a minute. You iterate around this. If you do this in a systematic way, you end up at the end with what I would consider and only then would I consider it an idea. Now this thinking process has an interesting name, function follows form which is backwards from the normal way you hear that. Normally we hear this as form follows function. But here, I hope you see that we're turning that around. We're creating the form first, color changing milk bottle, and then figuring out the function that can be formed. All right, let's, let's practice this. Let me go off screen just for a minute. I'll uh, stop sharing just for a second. And let's see if it, if there are any questions or any thoughts, um, and feel free to type those in. My plan, it's uh, nine o'clock. My plan is to uh, teach you these two techniques, share some key principles with you, leave time for questions. You're welcome to ask questions anytime. And, and, and Chuck Chung has asked a, a good one already. <clears throat> what about the phrase, necessity is the mother of all inventions? And Chuck, I would say it's just the opposite. Invention is the necessity, is the mother of all necessity. Invention is the mother of all necessity. We invent something and then realize what it can do. We just created a necessity. We just created a need. And that's really what this method is about. It's using your brain in a different way. And by the way, I'm not saying that you should give up on problem to solution innovation. Um, necessity is the mother of all invention. I'm not saying give up on that. All I'm saying is let's now add this other direction of innovation to make us even better, great innovators, world-class innovators. That's what's going on here. Thank you. Okay, uh, keep those questions coming. I'm gonna dive back into it. Anything, anything on anybody's mind you wanna type into the chat? Uh, Malika, okay, oh, maybe that's why we are buying things we don't even know we need. Uh, I, I would agree with that. I think you look at a company like Apple or others, success, I'm a marketer, I'm a career marketer, and I strongly believe in, um, marketing from a standpoint of don't go out and look at what they need, explain what they need, make what they need important. 
you look at a great company like L'Oreal, L'Oreal, the French company, the French beauty company. Uh, I have worked with them in the past. They are a um, fantastic company, fantastic people. But they never go out and interview women about what color lipstick they should buy. They never do market research. That's phenomenal. Billion, multi-billion dollar global leader in lipstick and other beauty care products. They never go out and market research it. You know why? They tell you what you're going to wear. <laughs> and, and women want that. Customers want that. Uh, so, Bun Horn, let's see. Do you think by creating solutions first rather than starting off with the problems, would it lead to product marketing misfit? And that's a, a wonderful question. I would tell you that the, if you do the thinking process I just explained correctly, um, you, will, you will identify the, the solution as having a benefit or not, right? The very first question. If it doesn't have a fit, throw it out. Now, what's interesting is I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't test your ideas. Um, I think what's also interesting is that, you know, many companies, where do, where do many companies go to get ideas? They go to customers and guess what? Customers don't have a very good track record of giving you ideas because they have fixedness too. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't talk to customers. What I am saying is that our fixedness prevents us from seeing opportunities. You need a structured tool to get to use your brain and help you overcome the fixedness to see opportunities you wouldn't have seen otherwise. But it's a, it's a great, great question. All right, I'm gonna go back and share my screen. We're doing great on time. Feel free again to ask questions. And um, I'm gonna have an exercise for you in just a minute. So let's get ready to learn our first technique. <clears throat> In fact, here comes your first, your first test. So get ready to type this into the chat. <clears throat> I want you to take a look at these four items and tell me what they have in common. Here you have a package of powdered soup. Here you have a contact lens. Here you have a child's high chair, uh, a, a, a child's chair that would et, fit on the edge of the kitchen table. And here you have an exercise bicycle. Now I want you to look at these four items and I want you to type into the chat function, what do they have in common? What do they have in common? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing here and see what anybody says. Uh, let's see, the things that people use every single day, this is true. So, so Kanha has an interesting answer. I'll come back to that. Human needs, this is true, but not what I'm looking for. Any other guesses? Any other guesses? Okay, well, um, we have alternatives. They're an invention. This is true. Hiroko, thank you so, so much. Instant fix from Malika, yep. Uh, yeah. So Kim Hong, yeah, you're right. Subtraction and um, uh, so, so Kan Ha said this before too. It's the subtraction technique. Let me go back to my screen and show you what it is. This is exactly right. All four of these elements can be explained by one of the five patterns, in this case, the subtraction pattern. So take a look at the powdered soup, for example. What has been subtracted to create powdered soup? If, you, if you've had powdered soup before, you know it's the water, the liquid. What has been removed or subtracted from the contact lens? Well, it's the frame that sits on your face right, that, that you no longer need. What about the child's high chair? Of course, it's the four legs 
And what about the exercise bicycle? You should see that it's the rear wheel. All four of these items can be explained by the subtraction pattern. Subtraction is defined as removing a core essential element rather than the addition of new systems or functions. It's taking some of the, one of the components one at a time and imagining it no longer there. Here's how we do subtraction. We start by listing internal components, the things directly attached to the system or function. Then we take one of those, preferably an essential one, and we'll do an example in a minute, and imagine it being no longer in the system. We just, we, re we remove it. That creates that virtual product, that thing that's gonna make you feel very uncomfortable at first. Then we ask ourselves two questions, always in this order. The first question always is, should we do it? What would be the benefit? Who would want it? And in what situations would this make sense? If we find a benefit, then we ask ourselves, can we do it? Do we have the know-how, the ability? Is it feasible? Now, if necessary with this technique, you can replace the function, but not with the original component that you took away. You can replace it with something else in the immediate vicinity. I'm going to define this thing called the closed world for you in a few minutes. And then you modify the new product to improve it. Okay, so let's practice as a group. I'm going to engage all of you. So I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to put down your, your whatever it is you're holding, your, maybe your evening dinner or your, your, your smartphone. And I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Uh, let's look at an everyday product like this. Just a typical flat screen TV. Now, to use subtraction, what we would do is we would make a numbered list of each element of the, of the TV. And so we would have things like the screen and we would have the, uh, we'd have the brand, we'd have the stand, We'd have the frame, there are uh, inputs, there's a, there's a remote control, right? So we, we'd make a numbered list of all the components. Pretty straightforward. Now, once we make a numbered list, we have to imagine removing one of them. So I'm going to call on um, Hiroko-san, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to imagine removing one of those elements. So type into the type into the chat room, Hiroko-san, what, what would you like to remove? The screen. The screen? Are you trying to give me a hard time? <laughs> Is your question like um do you mean like do you hear me? Yes. And can I talk? <laughs> yeah, 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 please. Yeah, our group is not too large. We can, we can use our, uh, our voice function, Stephen. That's okay. <laughs> we'll have people go up. Hiroko, I, I, you <laughs> took the screen away. Are you, being, uh, are you just trying to be funny? No, no, no. Like, um, so do you want me to start thinking about the new product? Okay, uh, okay. You, Let's hang on. Let's go back yeah. to screen share. You're very courageous. Yeah. <laughs> You're very courageous. Thank you. Let's see. That's actually a very interesting pick. Now, let's let's remember what is this? What are our steps of subtraction? We remove a component, preferably an essential one. You have taken away the screen. Now, let me ask you this question: What would be the benefit of taking away the screen? What What do we have now? The resulting virtual product. What do we have? Um, Anybody? Sorry. Anybody? Go ahead and type it in or, or take your phone off mute. Or your uh, computer off mute, I'm sorry. Any ideas? So what do you have now? You've taken, Hiroko has taken the screen away and 
we have an answer of a virtual projecting of the picture. Ah. Now, I'm sorry to say, Shrenyang, that you have just made the first mistake of the evening. <laughs> but thank you for trying. What you did is very common at this stage. What you did is you are still trying to put the picture back into the screen, into the, into the activity. You're trying to replace the visual part of it. Um, and as Chuck mentioned, without the screen, we must now think about very different. And Chuck, let me, let me make that even simpler. All I want you to do at this stage, no matter how crazy this sounds, is ask one simple question first, which is, what would be the benefit? Okay, you take the screen out, what would be the benefit? And um, Kim Hong has said it's easy to transport. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier to transport. Um, the screen takes up a big space. You're right, Hiroko. That's, that's true. Now it can be much smaller. Who would use a screenless TV? Who would use a screenless TV? It's a, for all of you, put your, put your phone, uh, put, go ahead and open your mute if you'd like, or type it in. Astronauts, mm, maybe. Those who live in small rooms, very good. Shrinkable frame without the screen. It'd be much smaller, you're right. But who would use a screenless TV? Go ahead and say it. I know you're thinking it. You're probably thinking people that might have visual problems, disabilities, people that are blind. No, that's, that's, that may be true. What about all of you? How many of you have ever had the TV on in the room? while you were cooking or cleaning, but you weren't really watching it. Come on, be honest. How many of you have done that? I'm, will <laughs> I'm willing to bet that all of you have done that at some point. And what's true, yes, May, you know, she's, she's admitting to it. Thank you, May. I'm looking at the chat function here. Livin has uh, done it, me, me. <laughs> I, I know I have. You've all, used the TV without the screen. And there are many benefits to taking the screen out as you've already identified. It's gonna be a lot smaller, not take up so much room. It's gonna be easier to move. It's gonna be a lot cheaper, right? It's going to um, not be as distracting, not collect dust. A lot of benefits to a screenless TV. But let me be honest with you. When Hiroko mentioned screen, what was the first thing that went through your mind? What was the very first thing that went through your mind? Go ahead and type it in if you care to. I'm willing to, to bet it's not a TV anymore, right? And, and that's a very common reaction to it. Uh, okay, so somebody says it's like a radio. And, and that also is what I would consider a mistake. I don't want you to do that. Mistake meaning, here's what happens when you use this method, when this technique in particular. Your mind does one of two things, and we have seen it. Your mind first rushes in to try to rescue it by replacing it with something. Or your mind tries to explain it with the closest thing that it resembles. Taking the screen out of a TV now makes it like a radio. And we don't want you to do that. We want you to resist that because once again, you're letting your fixedness creep in. Um, and, and so this technique will create configurations that at first don't seem to make any sense. And guess what? A screenless TV already exists. It's called satellite radio. In the US, we have a provider called Sirius XM. You probably have your providers and they broadcast live TV channels without the screen all over the world. So this is a quick introduction to the subtraction technique. Now there's one, one other thing to, to think about here. I'm gonna go back to my screen. You know, we could find many benefits of taking the screen out of a TV. 
and we certainly can do it. It's been done. But if we want to, we can replace the function of the component, but not with the original component. So I ask you, look around you in your environment right now. What could replace the screen of a TV from where you are, whether it's at home or at work or somewhere else? What could replace the screen of a TV? Well, probably the thing you're looking at right now, a computer or a smartphone. You could replace the screen of a TV with a LCD projector, or as the British call it, a beamer. You could replace the screen of a TV with um, Google Glasses, something that I'm sure we're gonna see more of that technology coming along. The subtraction technique is, is quite powerful. And what I wanna do now is I wanna share with you a real example from, from my experience in my career of using the subtraction technique. Actually, my very first time using the SIT method at all. And here's the story. Stephen mentioned before my academic career, I worked for the healthcare company uh, called Johnson & Johnson. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, I was in the medical device division. We, we made instruments for surgery. Uh, and it was about a $4 billion US division of J&J, &J, very big division. We decided to expand our business and get into what you see here. What you see here is a, an anesthesia machine. This is just a CAD CAM rendering, a, a, a prototypical drawing of this machine. It, it didn't exist at the time. This machine administers anesthesia during a procedure like uh, colonoscopy or some sort of uh, plastic surgery or dental. Um, and it's quite innovative already. It's innovative because it does the anesthesia without the anesthesiologist. Pretty, pretty interesting, pretty weird actually. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the head of the unit, the head of this team was a, a colleague and a friend of mine. And he came to me one day and he said, you know, Drew, we're, we're at a phase now where we need to decide to spend a lot of money on this device. And he goes, you know, I'm just, I'm just worried. And I said, Mike, why? What's, what worries you? It's a great machine. He said, well, you know, it is, but I, I just, something's nagging me. I just don't feel like we've really nailed it. And I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do. He goes, what do you think? And I, you know, at that point, uh, my colleagues and I, had experimented with pretty much every innovation method out there. We had worked with uh, disruptive innovation from Harvard, Clayton Christensen. We had worked with open innovation from the guys at Berkeley. We had tried jobs to be done, lateral thinking, design thinking, you name it. We had tried dozens of innovation methods and sadly wasting literally millions of dollars on these experiments. And so I said to my friend, Mike, I said, Mike, you know, I just read some interesting research by this guy named Jacob Goldenberg, the idea that patterns can be used. And I don't know, it just sounds very appealing to me. What, what do you say we try it? Let's do a pilot program, just maybe a day. I'll pay for it. You just bring a team there and let's apply this method to your unit. What's the worst that could happen? So we did. We pulled together a team of 12 people at a um, offsite location, and we applied the subtraction technique. In fact, we're going to do that right now. So let's imagine we're in a room. We're gonna apply the subtraction technique does anybody remember the first step of subtraction? What do you do the first step? We make a list of components, right? So we make a list of components. Here again, we have the screen. I'll, I won't list them all, but I'll just, I'll just go through and, and check them off here. You have a screen, you have a keypad, you have a, a hinge, a frame, 
This is the drug. You have a, a printer down here. This is called the carousel where you connect patients. And very importantly, <clears throat> inside of this is a power unit and a backup battery. Because by law, any device that is used in the US or in Japan or in many countries, probably Cambodia, any device used in an operating room has to have not just the primary power, but also a backup uh, battery in case the power goes out. If you were using this machine to administer anesthesia during a major procedure and the power went out, that, person, that, pa that patient could die. So it's very serious. Okay. So we make a list of all the components. And then what we did is we broke the, the group into pairs, two people working together. And each pair was assigned one component at a time. Each pair had of people was given one component. And their job was to take that component out and imagine benefits. So let's imagine in here is the backup battery. And you're part of this team. And the facilitator comes up to you and says, okay, um, you have the backup battery. What do you think was the reaction of that, of those two participants? What do you think said? What, what do you think came out of their mouth? Go ahead and take your computer off of mute and offer, what do you think was their reaction? Any guesses? Who would oh like to God. venture? Oh my God. Say again, Chuck. Say again. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Actually, Chuck, it was even more colorful than that. Okay. <laughs> but it was, you're pretty close. <laughs> they were assigned the backup battery and they went, oh my God, you can't take out the backup battery. It's against the law. And they looked at me and said, Drew, this is stupid. We, 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 we're going to waste a day doing this? You can't take out the backup battery. Everybody knows that. Remember what that condition is called? Everybody remember what that condition is called? It's called fixedness. And this is where they experience that very strong visceral reaction that is very common when you use this method. But let's be true to the process. In fact, let me ask you now. Let's imagine, not that we're going to, but let's just imagine this device no longer has a backup battery. Uh, I know you're not experts in, in medical devices, but just tell me, what do you think would be some of the benefits if you took the backup battery out? Any guesses? What would be It'll some be of the bad? Say again, Hiroko? It's lighter. It's going to be a lot lighter. It can be portable. It can be very portable. Thank you. What else? It's going to be a lot cheaper. It's going to be less maintenance and reliability issues. Batteries are notoriously difficult. Yep. Um, sorry. Uh, Sheree Worth, thank you. It's going to be smaller, lighter, cheaper. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, very, very much so. In fact, what the engineer told me was, was fascinating. Um, he said, Drew, the, the backup battery is most of the space in this unit inside. He said, if you really could take out the battery, you wouldn't believe how incredibly simple this project becomes. Okay. Now, Great, so there's a lot of benefits to taking out the back of battery, but we have to go to the second question. The second question is, can we do it? Well, we can, but what's the challenge? The challenge is you'll go to jail. <laughs> it's, it truly is against the law. So let's go back to our question here. If necessary, we can replace the function of the backup battery but we have to do something from this environment here. So I ask all of you, what could replace 
the backup battery of that machine from this environment and only this environment here. Any guesses? What do you think? You would like to try. Wasn't it the battery was for the power function? So, uh, is that um, so, Kana? Yeah. Um, Say it again for me, that, please. Or Netra, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was saying like it was the backup battery. So basically, it was when the blackout was there was a blackout, and that was the function for power. Was it? Okay, so I think what you're saying is that hook it up to a backup battery system, maybe in the hospital. And let's imagine that we can't do that. Um, and Chuck has the idea of stationary bicycle that generates power. Um, do you see, Chuck, do you see any of those in that room? No. So I want you to work only what's in the typical operating room. There are no stationary bicycles. There's no generator in here. The generators are in the, the basement of the hospital. Other tries? What could replace the backup battery from just what you see here? Any guesses? Okay, let me help you. Do you see this device here? This is called the defibrillator. This is the piece of emergency equipment that they use to bring your heart back pumping. And guess what it has on board? It has a small backup battery. And so one of the engineers says, well, you know, we could take our device here and we could imagine taking a, a cable and attaching it to the backup battery of this device. And I said, really, can you do that? He goes, well, it, you know, there's plenty of power on both units. There, the, the hookup is very easy. We don't have to change anything. And all of a sudden, you could have seen the look on people's faces. They all went like this. Oh my God. Oh my God, to use Chuck's, <laughs> to use Chuck's comment. They were stunned. They had never considered something like this. And what's interesting is we weren't done. We had more to do. Let's go back and let's look at this machine again. Let's imagine you were part of the team and you were assigned the screen. Okay. First of all, imagine you're one of the participants and you're told that we're going to remove the screen. What do you think was their reaction, their first reaction to that assignment? What do you think was their reaction? Any guesses? <clears throat> it was a lot stronger than, oh my God. <laughs> it, was, it was very angry. It's impossible, think it's impossible. They were stunned, right, uh, Pop? They were, uh, they were absolutely angry about it. They were, they were looking at me and they were saying, you wanna take out the screen? Do you know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars we have spent on market research to develop the most perfect screen in the anesthesia business? Anesthesias have screens and ours is gonna be the best in the I'm industry. Sure I understand. Stop. My, my, my watch is talking to me. Yeah, they were, they were very angry about it. And once again, why? What were they experiencing at that step? Very strong fixedness once again. And this is what this method does. Folks, here's what's true. Think about the creative act. What is the creative act? The creative act happens when two previously unrelated things come together. When two things are sort of forced together and made to work. And you see it many times all around you. You will see it 
creative things and you'll realize it's the combination of two or more things. And that's all this method does. It forces you to combine things that you wouldn't do on your own because of fixedness. You, you would resist doing it. It wouldn't make any sense to you. And fortunately, the method does the work for you. So let's go back to our, our anesthesia machine. Let's imagine now we're going to take out the screen. Not that we're going to, but if we did, what do you think would be some of the benefits? Well, I'll help you here, right? It's gonna be lighter. It's gonna be cheaper, more portable, right? Um, smaller, very good. Uh, and yeah, what would be another very important benefit if you took the screen out. I'm going to, I'm going to wait to see if I can get anybody to identify it. What do you think would be a really important benefit of taking the screen out? Who has an idea? Anybody? You feel free to use your microphone if you'd like to share a thought. Ah, Chuck. Boy, Chuck, I don't know where you are, but you're really on it right now. You look at what Chuck wrote. You don't have to take your eyes off the patient. If you didn't have a screen, you wouldn't have to look at it. Very good. You may have, I think you may have read my book. <laughs> no? Okay, good. Very good. One of the marketing people said, oh my God, you wouldn't be distracted. Again, their reaction was, they were shocked. And now imagine you put an anesthesia machine in the market without a screen. Without a screen, what are you saying to the market about that machine? It's amazing that it's truly intuitive. It's superior to everything out there. Yet taking the screen away was very emotional. The thought, so much pride had gone into building that screen the mere suggestion of taking it out was revolting to them. Now, can we do it? Can we take the screen out? Yeah, we can. What would be the challenge? Well, how do you monitor the patient? So let's now go back into our room here. And I want you to look carefully into the room. And I want you to Think again about this as our closed world. What could replace the screen of a TV from this environment? Does anybody see it? What could replace the screen of a TV? What about this right here? This is actually the primary monitor that the doctor is looking at to go inside the patient. It's the, it's the endoscopy camera. And one of our engineers says, well, Drew, we could take the data from our machine. We just Bluetooth it up and we put it on the outside of this machine, like a, like a heads up display, what's the benefit? Well, now the doctor has to only look at one place. And here again, their reaction was stunning. They were absolutely floored at the idea of being able to do this. And what's interesting is that we applied subtraction one time to this machine, to a team that had worked on this device for about two years. And in their minds, it was perfect. Now, after one round of subtraction, the team went to lunch. They came back after lunch. My friend, the team leader, Mike, he came to me and he said, Drew, we're gonna stop the workshop. I said, why? It's going great. He goes, oh yeah, it's going great. It really is. He said, guess what? The team has decided to throw out the old configuration and start the entire project over again. They threw out two years of work because one application of subtraction made them realize they had missed so many opportunities. And what they did about three months later is we did a full uh, four-day workshop using the SIT method to create a completely new anesthesia concept. 
where it's now two small units. One is attached to the patient. One is in the operating room. By the way, the new concept has a small screen and it has a small backup battery. Because the point of subtraction isn't truly to take the, the component out permanently. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. The point of subtraction is to mentally imagine taking it out only so that you can see potential benefits that you weren't willing to consider before. Then you can put it back in or replace it with something else. So this is the subtraction technique. I'm going to pause and just look over at the chat room and see if you have any questions or you'd like to put your microphone on. We're, we're certainly willing to take questions if you'd like to speak over your microphone. Any questions? Okay. All right. Feel free anytime to interrupt or, or chat into your chat room, type into your chat function. And let's, uh, Stephen, what do you say? Keep going here. We're doing, doing okay. All right. Great. You're a good group. I appreciate your engagement tonight. So let's go back to our, our presentation here. And here's what I want you to realize. Subtraction is a very powerful technique. It's only one of five. Uh, it's very suitable for starting the ideation process. Whenever we ideate, we usually start with subtraction uh, because it's, it really does open you up to new possibilities as you saw with the anesthesia machine and the TV. Um, subtraction is appropriate for something that's been around for a long time, a mature product or business model. It usually leads to fresh ideas, especially in services that haven't been renewed for a while. It's very interesting. Remember, the mistake you would make with subtraction is to think that you use it to, to lean out something, to cut cost. That's not why we use subtraction. You don't use subtraction just to cut things out permanently as, as, as a cost cutting method. It's not what it's for. It's to take out something essential to see what you could do with all the remaining all right, I'm going to move on and I want to cover a principle and one more technique before we adjourn for this evening. And the principle I want to cover with you now is an important one. They're all important, but this one is, is very important. You've heard me refer to it before. You've heard me refer to the closed world. It's a principle. What the principle says is this, when solving a problem or creating a new solution, one should strive to use only those resources that exist in the product or system itself or in its immediate vicinity. What that means is this. When solving a problem, the further away you have to go to get the solution and bring it to the problem, the less creative it's going to be. The closer the solution is to the problem, the more creative it's going to be. In other words, there's an inverse relationship between the proximity of the problem and the solution and its level of creativity. Think of the closed world as an imaginary boundary. It's, a, it's an imaginary zone, an imaginary space that you get to draw. But once you draw it, you imagine yourself stuck there. You're put there and you want to stay in there. Now, let's do an example. Let's see if I can prove to you this point about how creative solutions happen closer to the problem in the vicinity, the immediate vicinity. I want you to imagine you're driving around Cambodia, you're out in the countryside, and you get a flat tire. And I see Hiroka san smiling. Hiroka, have you ever had a flat tire? No myself but the bus the, the long distance oh it's bus. been on a bus okay all right <laughs> it was horrible okay now imagine you get a flat tire in your car you go back to the trunk of your car or the boot as the british like to call it you go back to the trunk and you take out all the things to change your tire um and when you put on this this wrench here to try to take off the tire, you notice that the lug nuts, 
the, the bolts that hold the tire on are rusted and they're rusted frozen solid. You can't turn, ah, you try turning the wrench and you can't turn it at all. You try jumping on it, you try hitting it, nothing seems to work. So what would you do? What would be your first reaction? Now, if you've read the book or, or know the answer to this, please hold, hold it for the others. But go ahead and type in, what would you do if you had a, uh, a flat tire and you couldn't take it off? What would be your first reaction? Type it in, what would you do? You call for help. Thank you, Brock. Yep. <laughs> you, you call for help or you ask for help. You get, get find other support. Um, call Uber or, or call your, your family or friends. Maybe get a ride from somebody. Um, so, okay, those are all pretty, pretty typical. Ah, put lotion or oil on the screw remover. Okay, let's, let's go back and see, you're coming up with some interesting ideas. Now, if you had this problem, you could use your cell phone and call for help or get a ride. Um, that's certainly true. Now I wanna do the experiment again. But now what I wanna do is I want you to imagine that you have to use only the elements of the car. You are defining a closed world as the car itself and everything in the car. And your solution must come from within the car itself and everything inside of it. All right, so now what would you do? What would you do? We have, um, Bun Horn has an idea, put oil on the screw, take oil from the engine. Yep, that might work. What else, what else could you do here? Any ideas? What else could you do here? Certainly could use uh, oil. Another idea is actually brake fluid. Brake fluid does a very good job of, re of reducing rust. Any other things you can use in the car? Any ideas? Try to change the wheel. Yeah, you've tried that, uh, Kunket, but you can't. It's frozen shut, locked because of rust. Any other ideas? I'm looking at the chat room here. Who has an idea? What could you do here? Who has an idea? Okay, hope, I hope none of you get flat tires. <laughs> let, me, let me go back and share my screen. I, here's what some uh, of my students in the past have said. They have said things like, well, use oil, which we had. Uh, you could use part of the car to give more um, leverage, to try to get more leverage here, more power. Or some people have said, drive the car with the tire wrench attached. In other words, rock the car back and forth, perhaps put, put a big rock or stone here. Some people have said use the cigarette lighter to heat up, heat these up, and they would expand, which is also a clever idea. Good, okay. Now let's do the experiment one more time. Let's imagine I'm going to constrain you to your closed world as just the elements that came out of the trunk of your car. And your solution must come from just these elements. You can only use the things that are in this diagram here. Who has an idea? What could you do to change the tire of this car with only, how would you get the lug nuts off? Any ideas? <clears throat> Some of you may know this. If you don't, who has an idea? What could you do? Let's look at each element one by one. Well, 
force yourself to imagine the tire. What if the tire was used, the spare tire? Here's the, this is already, you're trying to use this already. These are other tools. What about this? This thing here is the jack. Could it be used to help us remove the tire? Could it be used to, re, to Hiroko, how? How could it be used? Lift up the, the body of the bus. Well, that's what the jack already does. It lifts up the body of the car. Mm -hmm. But now the problem is your, your tire is stuck. Your, your, these lug nuts are stuck oh, on there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. see these things, how do you get, how mm -hmm. could you use yeah. the, the jack to get these things off? Any ideas? Wait. Any ideas? Okay, let me help you here. What if you took the jack and put it under the wrench and used the power of the jack to turn the wrench and break the force of the rust? That's actually a very good solution. And it's a very feasible solution because the jack is powerful enough to lift a car. It is certainly going to be powerful enough to turn a wrench and remove the rust, uh, the rusted bolt. This story is a true story. It was actually a story by my co-author, Dr. Jacob Goldenberg, when he was stuck in the deserts of Israel with his friend. And the two of them got a flat tire and didn't have a way to change it. And it was Jacob that came up with this idea of using the jack. And it led them to discover this very important principle of creativity called the closed world principle. And here's, here's the interesting story about this. When you look at the solutions of using a phone, we would consider that a very far away solution, not very creative. And by the way, the best solution to a problem doesn't have to be creative. You all don't always need a creative solution. The best solution may be completely uncreative. But if you want creative solutions, then you need to define and work within a closed world. Notice how we got closer in proximity as we got very close in proximity to this final solution here the level of creativity goes up. The closed world is an essential principle of the method. The, the closed world is so important that we consider it really the starting point of any discussion around creativity. What is your closed world? And, and I wanna share a quick story. Uh, this is a client of mine, a pharmaceutical company called Eli Lilly. A few years ago, they contacted me and they said, Drew, we need your help. We are struggling with how to uh, expand the use of our diabetes drug in China. And I said, okay, all right. I said, what's the problem? And they said, well, it's you know such a big market. There's so many different issues. Um, and I knew right away that the problem they had is a closed world problem, that they really hadn't defined the closed world first. So I sat the team down and I said, look, let's, let's just think about this for a minute. Instead of all of China, let, maybe let's just pick one city in China and talk about it first. And they said, okay, Shanghai. <laughs> I said, all right. Uh, 27 million people, pretty big city. I said, let's, let's go into the interior of China and pick a city maybe the size of where I live, maybe um, around 2 million people. And they looked at me and they sh shook their head. They're like, wow, this is crazy. Why would we do this? And I said, no, 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 just, just uh, stick with me. So let's look at this little city. We found a, a, a small city by Chinese standards, a small city of 2 million people. 
And I said, let's go even further. Let's, let's imagine we're gonna go onto the outskirts into the suburbs of this town. Let's go to a small village that's maybe 20,000 people. And they're, they're scratching their head. They're like, why would we do this? And I said, now let's, let's imagine we're in this small village. Let's go to one part. Let's go to one small neighborhood. Okay, now let's get it down. Let's imagine, let's think about just one, one street, one stretch of homes. In fact, I want you to imagine one home on that street with one man, age 50, with type 2 diabetes. Okay? They're like, okay. Now, what I want you to do is I want you and your team to sit down right now and figure out how to get your drug from where it's made in the U.S. into that man's body every day at the right dose. Just for him. Every day. And they looked at me and, and they said, why? And I said, because if you can't figure it out for one man, what makes you think you're going to solve the rest of China? But if you can figure out how to get it into that man's body, and you can figure out all the shipping and logistics, all the supply chain, all the pharmacy relationships, the, the refrigeration, the needle disposal, if you can figure out all the activities for him, then go to another house on that street and figure it out for that patient. And then when you get that street settled, go to another street in that neighborhood and figure it out. And then go to another neighborhood in the village and get the village taken care of. And then go to another village around this city. And then go to the city and figure it out. You see what's happening? In other words, we are starting our closed world with one patient. And this is exactly what they did. And they were very successful and saw the problem so much more fluidly and creatively. All right, we are um, going to, um, I have time to teach you one more technique. If that's okay, Stephen, we good? All right, you've been a great group. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm gonna, we're gonna do another challenging problem here. Okay. I want you to uh, hear the story about a famous inventor. You may recognize this inventor. His name is Thomas Edison. And Thomas Edison was very wealthy. Uh, to get into the, his home, he lived in a very big mansion. But to get into it, you had to go through this gate. But there was something very odd about this gate. To get through this gate, you had to push uh, really hard to open it up. And then uh, you had to push it again to close it. And it just seemed very strange that a guy like Thomas Edison would have this, this gate. And it wasn't until he passed away after he died, they realized that Thomas had attached a pump, a small pump to the gate so that every time it was open and closed, you were pumping fresh water into the plumbing system of his house. Now it's a nice little story to demonstrate our next technique, which is called task unification. Task unification is defined as follows. Task unification is assigning an additional job to an existing resource. Some component has its original job, and now you have forced it to take on an additional job. So in the story of Thomas Edison and his gate, what component has been given an additional job? Well, there are two actually. One is the gate. The gate itself has the job of opening and closing. Now it pumps water. But there's a second component in the story, the visitor themselves. The visitor has their original job of visiting Thomas and now the additional job of activating the gate. And so task unification, we start by listing internal and external components. 
meaning things that are in the closed world but not in our control. We take a component and we assign an additional task to it. That becomes the virtual product, just like color changing milk bottle or screenless TV. And then we ask ourselves two questions. The first question, should we do it? Is there a benefit? Can we do it? And then we modify the new product to improve it. So let's imagine you all work for a large grocery company, a, a grocery store or grocery company. Grocery companies know that if they can keep consumers in the store longer, they tend to buy more. In fact, what do grocery store companies do today to keep you in the store longer? In the US, they do things like change the, the aisles or they put samples around everywhere or they'll put the important things like milk and eggs all the way in the back of the store. Uh, this is what they do in the US. Now we're going to use task unification and see if it can help us be more creative. So what's the first step of task unification? Remember, we always start by listing the internal or external components. All right, so we would make a list of the components of a grocery store. So for example, we would have things like the carts, the freezers, the aisles. All right, now I'm gonna go off screen here and I'm gonna pick on somebody. Um, Malika, are you still with us? Can I ask you to imagine a grocery store and I want you to pick out one component of a grocery store for me, just one component, it can be anything. Is she there? Okay, the stroller. Ah, the stroller, the cart. Okay, or in the UK, they call it the trolley, the stroller. Right. All right, very good. Thank you. Now, here's the assignment. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds. And here's the assignment. I want you to imagine the cart, the grocery cart, has the additional job of keeping people in the store longer. The grocery cart has the additional job of keeping people in the store longer. It sounds weird, but that's what this method does. It forces you to create combinations your mind wouldn't do on its own. So 30 seconds, I want you to think of what would be the benefit and how would it work? What is, the, what is the stroller, the grocery cart, doing to keep customers in the store longer? Sounds weird, but let's see if you can come up with an idea. Okay, so make the cart bigger and heavier to push. <laughs> Maybe it becomes um, um, uh, a exercise equipment or it's for people that need the stability. Maybe it's heavy because people that have a difficult time walking, now they can use it and give them stability. Uh, Chuck had an idea, keep track of the mileage and give out coupons. All right, so the, the cart keeps track of how long you've been in. Hey Chuck, please don't, don't ever do that because my wife, she would never leave the grocery store. <laughs> She would be pushing her cart <laughs> to get those coupons. Um, okay, so Lee Horror, Trey, thank you. Put the advertising of promotion on the trolley. Very good. Get people, maybe make suggestions. Very good. Keep going. We're not done. Let's, let's think of other ways. Auto trolley. Okay, very nice. Jean Sophie, mom. Okay, thank you. What other ideas do you have? Uh, play favorite music. Okay, you could play favorite music or it could be Hiroka has the idea of, of using it as di or directional uh, mini games. If you maybe if you had kids in the cart, you can put little games in there for them. Or somehow the cart is part of an overall game, a hide and seek or some sort of find the product. 
Uh, attached headphones, very good. Okay, so it could re regenerate as you're rolling. It somehow is also um, charging your phone. Very good. So Chuck, Chuck suggests matching items. So if you put this type of noodles in your cart, it gives you a suggestion of what kind of sauce you might want to use with it, for example. Keep them turning around from row to row. The cart is difficult to turn left and right. <laughs> okay. Now, a smart stroller. Now let's go to this one by uh, Pav Pan um, Hapase. Um, it's funny. Keep the keep them turning around from row to row, so the card is difficult to turn left or right. Now that sounds silly. That sounds silly, but here's what I want you to do. This is what happens in workshops. Somebody will say something that is, okay, let's see what else he says here. Keep them turning around from row to row. Let's, sometimes somebody like this will say something that sounds very silly, but now I want us all to take this, this seemingly silly suggestion from um, Pav. Keep them turning around from row to row. The cart is difficult to turn left or right and no handle on the cart. Let's, let's start with no handle on the cart. Now, not that it's a good idea or anything. All I want you to do now is give me one benefit of not having the handle on the cart. From the customer's point of view, the grocery store's point of view, now let's imagine a cart with no handle and customers love it. Why? What would be a benefit? Think about right now with the pandemic. Any ideas? What would be the benefit of a grocery cart with no handle? I don't care how silly it sounds. The cart follows you without touching. Okay, perhaps you don't have to touch it, right? You don't have to roll it. You can grab more products. You free your hands up. It follows along with you. Uh, you don't have to touch it because of coronavirus. Supermarket can now control it for you, perhaps. It uses a sensor. Okay, we don't want to worry about how we do it. All we want to do is look for benefits first. You can use your legs to control the cart. Don't worry about how it works. Worry about the benefit first. The benefits, um, you wouldn't have to clean it. You wouldn't have to repair it. Um, you don't, so it's, it's less work for the, for the uh, customer. Actually, it's a pretty neat idea. Take the handle off and the cart just follows along with you. Um, and less parts, very good, Chuck. Um, when the carts are mashed together, it's easier to store them together. There isn't the handle that gets in the way now. So this is a very, very nice idea of how the cart all of a sudden is providing more value for the customer. Very, very well done. This is how we would use this technique. I'm gonna show you a video. Um, so I'll, uh, hopefully you can hear this video. Let's see if we can get it to play. And then I'm gonna show you some examples of the task unification technique. All right, so here comes a video. Let's uh, turn up your volume so you can hear this. Okay, it's not, you, I can't hear it at my end. So do you hear it, Stephen, or no? No, okay. All right, so unfortunately, I'm not able to get sound. Let me go ahead and stop. Sorry about that. Uh, so I wanna show you some examples of the task unification technique before we finish tonight and leave time for questions. Here is, a, an, an apple, and notice here on the label, you have the barcode, which is used to, to scan and check out, but then you also have something here. Here's how this works. When you get home and you put the fruit underwater to wash it in the sink, 
this label dissolves automatically and turns into a soap appropriate for washing fruit. I saw Hiroko's uh, reaction like, pretty good. <laughs> like, wow. Uh, it gets rid of that little sticky label. You don't have to peel it off. And it becomes valuable, a classic example of task unification. Does that, anybody have children? This is a baby's pacifier. Notice that the baby's pacifier keeps track of the temperature of the baby. This is in Fahrenheit, but this would be used to, to track the baby's temperature. So now the baby has the job of taking the baby's temperature. Very, very useful. This is a concept used in uh, places like Australia for changing your tire if you're not on a flat surface. Now, what's interesting about this is as the exhaust fills up the balloon, the balloon raises the vehicle up. Here's my question to you. I'll stop sharing here. My question to you is, what part of that, con that concept has been recruited? What part of that has been task unified? Go ahead and type it in. Anybody guess or go, go on your microphone? What part of that concept has been recruited to do more work? You see it? The exhaust, exactly right, the exhaust. Now, my question that I want you to think about is, how do we normally think about the exhaust from a car? Normally, we think about it as wasteful as dangerous, as something to be gotten rid of. Yet here we're able to recruit it and make it useful. Again, a very creative solution of something in the closed world to create a, a value that wasn't there before. We use task unification a lot in marketing communications. This is a very, very popular candy around the world called Kit Kat. And this is this park bench, this bench has been made to look like a, a candy bar, a nice task unification. This is an example of a music store. The music store, the, here you see the security grate and the security fence looks like the, the front of a guitar amplifier. This is what a musician would use to play a guitar like I do. This is an, an example of a feature on many cars made by Nissan. <clears throat> Nissan. This concept is called the Easy Fill Tyra Alert. What happens is when, when people fill up their air, their tire with air, when they reach the correct pressure, the horn of the car goes beep beep. In other words, the horn notifies the consumer that they have put enough air in the tire. Very, very nice solution uh, because it's many times it's hard when you fill up your, your tire. You don't know how much air is actually going in there. This is an interesting idea from Korea. Um, this is a subway station in Korea. You see a man getting on the, the subway car here. Here's how it works. The, the walls of the subway station have been made to look like the walls of a grocery store. These are, this is just a picture. And commuters on their way home scan the products that they want to buy. The, the list then of those products is sent to their local grocery store and paid for, and they pick it up on the way home. Very, very nice idea. And so task unification, right? The the walls of the subway station have been recruited to act as a point of sale for a grocery store. Uh, very, very clever idea. I show this to people and they think, gosh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> okay, so uh, I just want to finish up by um, sharing some ideas about task unification. 
Task unification is a great technique to use when you have many constraints, which all of us do. Uh, constraints of time, constraints of money, constraints of regulations or scope. Um, it's a great tool and it forces you to use resources right around you for new things. It makes you much more resourceful and creative. We use task unification for lowering costs, becoming more efficient, but many times we'll also use task unification on an idea that has already emerged. In other words, we would take a technique like subtraction or division and then create ideas, but then make those ideas stronger by applying a couple rounds of task unification to it. It's a great technique to improve the quality of the ideas around you. Very popular technique. So I want to remind you, uh, as you finish your graduate studies, that creativity and innovation is a skill. It's a skill that you are going to make yourself more valuable in the, in the business community, in whatever it is you choose to do in life, if you can become more creative. And I hope you now see that you can become more creative no matter where you're starting from in the creativity scale. Uh, innovation is so important. And this is my favorite quote, the world leaders in innovation will also be the world leaders in everything else. Um, thank you very much for having me tonight. Here's uh, some, some resources for you. This is the book that Stephen referred to. This is my brand new book. It's coming out in January of 2021. It's basically how to use SIT, this method to enhance the, the prestige value of your products. I also have a podcast, uh, Innovation Inside the Box. We release a new podcast every Monday and it's just about SIT and you can find it on Apple, or Google or Spotify, any of the, any place you stream your podcasts, you can find this podcast. I hope you'll take advantage of it. I also have this course on LinkedIn learning. Um, I have a number of different courses. Some of you I understand have had the ability to take that course. Um, that explains the SIT method uh, very clearly. And between all of these resources, you have a lot of opportunity now to learn about this. Uh, what, what I would advise you too is you don't have to learn every technique. Just learn one or two and become very good at those rather than try to master all five right away. Uh, be very good at closed world, at function follows form, and maybe task unification or division or something whichever tool you seem to like the most or, or makes the most sense to you, use that tool, become very good at it. <clears throat> so let me stop sharing and ask uh, and open it up to questions. Um, are there any questions that you would like to pose to the group? We have about 15 minutes. So, and feel free to use your microphone. Um, I'd actually prefer that, but you can use either one. Any questions? From your experience, uh, this is Chuck. By the way, my internet and in my apartment is so bad, I came out to drive to the, uh, the nearest uh, intersection here <laughs> where I get the, the reception is good. So I'm sitting in this dark car. Anyways, I really appreciated your uh, lecture tonight. Um, Thank you. In your experience, uh, what were some of the, the most difficult things that people found uh, using these kind of methods? What, what did they have to really learn and come over? Yeah, the hardest part of the method is uh, it, two things. One is accepting the fact that they have fixedness. Fixedness is not, a, is not a bad thing. Fixedness is actually a good thing. You wouldn't want to get rid of your fixedness. Uh, if you are 
driving and you see a stop sign, uh, you, you want to know what that stop sign means so you don't um, get hurt. So fixedness is how we understand the world. But when you want to be creative, you have to find it, recognize it, honor it, then break it. And, the, and that's the hardest part for people. The second hardest part is asking the questions in the right order. We always want to ask, should we do it? What would be the benefit of a, of a grocery cart, of a trolley, without the handle? Don't worry about how we do it. Don't worry about if there's sensors or this. And, and this is our first tendency, especially if you're an engineer. If you're an engineer, you like fixing things and building things and it's it's fun uh, and you, you want to get to that can we do it first no you have to force yourself to find benefits because if there are any benefits don't even spend any more time on it this is why methods like brainstorming really don't work people come up with ideas but they're not feasible so let's let's come up with ideas that have value first and then see if we can build them not the other way around. See if we can build them and then test to see if it has value. Um, okay, so a comment. Kim Hong, thank you. Thanks a lot, Drew. You really hit the point. Okay, good. Easy to understand and very practical. Yeah, I would say it's a very practical method. It takes, it does take some experience and practice. So be patient, be fearless. You have to have some courage, especially the first time you use it, I see people kind of hold their breath like, oh, what if it doesn't work? <laughs> uh, if you use, if you're true to the process um, and, and use it in the right order, ask the right questions, is there a benefit? What would be the benefit? And, and overcome your fear, you'll find this method very successful. It's really the only method I found that works repeatably. Uh, and I can teach it to children I can teach it to CEOs. The children are easier than the CEOs. <laughs> they use it better. <laughs> All right, other questions? Feel free um, to take your microphone and use it. Sokan Ha, I see uh, you're, you, you've unmuted. Hiroko, do you have a question? Anybody? Um Yes, maybe. Well, it's a like partly question, partly comment. Um, I found your statement that to start that we usually start from problem and then solution, but we should actually start from solution and then present it to those who have that problem. I thought that was quite interesting mm -hmm. and I that's the way, that's quite, um, that was the reverse way of marketing that I knew. But um, I also thought it was a very like realistic way to deep the like, hidden market needs. Sometimes people who have problems don't even realize that they have that problem. So right. if you show the solution, then that's the time when they realize that's their problem. They had that problem. So yep. this yeah, is, I this thought is... it was really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, probably my question is, do you think that's applicable to any type of product or yeah. in any type of markets? Yeah, any type of product. I did this presentation uh, two nights ago for a group um, around the country in the US. And afterwards, I got an email from a lady from Facebook. She's head of their uh, innovation, new, new innovation development. And uh, her name was Sarah. Um, I forget her last name, but she, she wanted to know if it could be used on software, on, on service applications. And yes, absolutely. Anything that can be broken into components. So we can take Facebook and imagine taking it apart virtually taking apart and laying its parts on the on your desk and and then when we can br break it into components we can manipulate those components with one of the five techniques and i've done this with facebook i've done it with pinterest i've done it with twitter it works very well 
So just because it's a virtual or digital product, you can do it with PowerPoint, you can do it with Zoom. Um, not, you don't go down to the level of computer code. Uh, just like with the TV, we didn't go down to every little screw and every little piece of plastic, we just the major components. Uh, but you're exactly right, Hiroko-san. You, you are, it's important that you uh, see this ability to go from the configuration. And then when the consumer sees it, they go, ah, I can use that. Mm -hmm. But if you had asked them before, they couldn't have explained it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. Other comment here. I saw your quote about the leader in innovation. So how could we create a culture of innovation inside us? Yeah, it's a, the culture of innovation is a common question. This is pretty much what the, the podcast is about. But it takes a, 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 a commitment to, in my view, developing the skills. If I said to you, let's create a culture of leadership, how would you do that? You would probably train people to be better leaders. If I said, let's create a culture of safety, what would you do? You would probably train people to, to practice, use good safety practices at work. If you want a culture of innovation, what should you do? Train people to use their mind in a creative way, meaning teach them the skills of innovation. I guarantee you, once people know the skill of innovation, they have no excuse now not to innovate. And innovation is its own reward. People feel, m humans are, very motivated to innovate. Now they have a way. Uh, so to me, that's the starting point. Not the, it's not the complete story, but it's, it starts with skills, in, in my view. Um, another question, Hiroka, totally agreed with you. This is the very first time that Drew showed me how the reverse, what I used to know, solution to the problem. It really works. And you want to be able to do both. Folks, I'm not saying you, shouldn't, you should stop doing problem to solution. There are many good problems that, that need solved. Um, and you're learning great things in, in your, your business school training and your management training. So you wanna be good at both. Here's a question. Can you give a quick example on applying SIT in process simplification or improved services? Yes. Uh, it's, we use it in service innovation all the time. Uh, you can use it, let's for example, in a, in a hotel or in uh, um, airlines now have innovated their check-in services a lot. Think about how you used to fly an airline. You used to have a paper ticket. You would give it to the, to the flight attendant when you got on the plane. Now you check in at home, you uh, scan your, your boarding pass before you get on it. Same thing with rental cars, same thing with banks. Banks have improved their services a lot. Um, so service innovation is uh, very viable. After all, what's the difference between a product and a service? Really nothing. They both are designed to deliver benefits. A product just happens to have everything all stuck together. A service has components too. They're just not all stuck together. Think of coffee service at Starbucks, right? That's a service. It certainly isn't the, you don't go there for the coffee. The coffee is horrible in my view <laughs> and overpriced, <laughs> but the service is great. Uh, another question here. Let's see. What are your techniques to come up with new ideas quickly about different innovations, especially if you're not from that sector or not familiar with that sector? You seem like someone who never gets stuck with ideas. Um, yeah, you know, I, I would also tell you, uh, my wife, for example, uh, she has lear learned this method too. And, and what's funny now is she always uses the same technique. She always uses the division technique. And when I met her 33 years ago, she wasn't very creative, very beautiful, very smart, very talented, but not creative. In fact, she would, she would tell you right now. <laughs> but now she's extremely creative. And she, she solves anything because she uses the division technique without even realizing it. 
So these patterns can become embedded in you to where you use them second nature. Um, so what I would suggest is you find one of the five techniques that you seem to like, you just seem to identify with. Practice that one. Use it in your daily life. Practice it properly. Okay, um, good. Well, we are about three minutes before ending here. I'm going to uh, uh, call on our moderator, our host this evening, Professor Patterson. So thank Professor, you. Would you go ahead and take over? Thank you. Thank you very much. Drew. Thanks, everybody. Um, this has been really good. And again, highly recommend the book. A lot more examples in the book. And also, what I find is the more that you do the SIT method, when you walk out in society, the more examples you see of the different techniques, whether it's division yeah. and multiplication. So you start to become more aware of the technique just through observation yes. in your environment. So again, thank you very much for your two hours. This is amazing. And uh, again, highly recommend the book, the podcast, and also uh, your website, uh, www.drewboy.com, where all of these materials are, are, are hosted. So again, have a great day. And great. again, all our participants for asking some amazing questions, much better than I expected. So our, our students are overperforming tonight, which is great to see. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now.